Good evening. I am your host, Isambard Inkblot. This weekend, 27th of September, marks the 200th anniversary of the first journey of a steam locomotive on a public railway. September 27th, 1825, a steam engine, hauling a train of coal wagons in one early passenger carriage, travelled between Stockton and Darlington, with much fanfare at a blistering 15 miles an hour. Well, why was it such a big deal? What's all this Rail 200 business about? To give you some context, I have been building this model railway set during that era. Before the steam locomotive, railways did exist, but they were usually horse-drawn and only went from coal mines to the nearest waterway. Before the railways, the height of inland transport technology was the canal. Canals were shallow, man-made rivers. Boats and barges were pulled along by mules walking alongside on the towpath. Freight traveled at about walking speed. Not only were the canals difficult to build, uh, but having so much standing water creates its own problems, especially in winter. If you wanted to get somewhere fast, the stagecoach was the best way. However, you were limited by the speed and endurance of your horses. Sounds like an awful lot of work, and uh, as a horse myself, I rather don't fancy it. So you can imagine why people were so shocked by this fire-breathing, steam-powered contraption back in 1825. 15 miles an hour doesn't seem all that fast, until you see it next to a canal boat doing about four. This machine is called Active, or as all her friends know her, Locomotion Number One. This wasn't the first locomotive ever, it wasn't the first to carry passengers, and it wasn't even the first one to be built by George Stevenson. But locomotion is significant as the first to run on a public railway. The slogan for the Stockton and Darlington Railway was Periculum Privatum Utilitas Publica, or At Private Risk for Public Service. If that doesn't summarize railways, I don't know what does. After the opening day celebrations, this engine continued to work on the Stockton and Darlington Railway, though it spent most of its time hauling coal while horses pulled the passenger trains. It wouldn't be until the Liverpool and Manchester Railway opened in 1830 that the steam locomotives really came into their own. This engine, called a planet type, was made by the same works who built locomotion, but already you can see how much the technology had evolved in just five years. Unlike locomotion, this planet type has all the moving parts hidden away, giving a smooth ride at the unbelievable speed of 30 miles an hour. What's important about this engine, though, is it was the first to be mass-produced. Engines of this and the later Payton-T design were built by the Stevensons and shipped all over the world, including to Germany, Russia, and the United States. Speaking of the US, the Americans started building steam locomotives as early as 1826, and from the beginning they started to diverge away from those made in Britain. Matthias Baldwin, a Philadelphia watchmaker and abolitionist, made a copy of Stevenson's planet type called Old Ironsides. Baldwin's engine didn't work very well, he got fed up, and he declared that he would never again build a steam engine. When Baldwin Locomotive Works closed 120 years later, they had built 50,000 locomotives. Another American builder, William Norris, came up with this briefly popular style of engine in 1838. If we put it alongside an English engine built by Todd, Kitson, and Laird at the same time, the two designs couldn't be more different. Apart from both having six wheels and a tender, the American engine has the pistons and valve motion on the outside and a springy iron flexible frame on the inside to cope with rough track. The British engine has the cylinders and most of the moving parts hidden away, with a stiff timber frame on the outside. If we take a look at the trains they're pulling, the carriages of the era take clear inspiration from stagecoaches. In some cases, it's quite literally a stagecoach body on rail wheels. In the early days, Britain's railways tended to have a first and second class accommodation. 
When the Liverpool and Manchester Railway debuted these open seconds on the opening day in 1830, the Duke of Wellington was horrified. It will encourage the working classes to move about, he declared. Second class passengers were upset with these carriages for an altogether different reason, which is that they had no roof. So you got all the soot and smuts from the engine flying at you. With these locomotive engines, they figured out how to get the trains going. Getting them to stop was uh, still a work in progress. Usually they would throw the engine into reverse and hope for the best. Some carriages had a roof seat for a brakeman to stop them should things unexpectedly uncouple. Speaking of stopping trains, signals were yet another necessary development. At first, you just had someone standing around with some flags. Then signal posts, operated by someone standing around with a watch, who would space the trains apart so that one would go by every ten minutes. Unfortunately, if there was an accident, what tended to happen was the signaler, who would have no idea there was an accident, uh, would make a train follow the next train, wait ten minutes, and then send it off, and then it would crash into the wreckage. Oh, and they also hadn't quite decided how wide the track or the trains should be yet, and as the railways were spreading all over the world, there were a few gauge wars, but that'll be a subject for another time. Once again, thank you for joining us. I have been Isenbard Inkblot, and if you're interested in seeing uh, more of uh, yours truly or other animated works, there are several new animated shorts being in, uh, in production at the moment, including one called Isambard Inkblot and the Power of Steam. Uh, feel free to uh, check those out and uh, support the creator as well.